Good morning. Good morning. Welcome or welcome back to Bookie Monsters. My name is PK. It is Friday, TGIF, July the 19th, and we are here to look at the rest of the new releases being set into the wild this week. And being Friday, it is Freeform Friday, and we just look at the things we didn't have time for, things that look interesting otherwise or are uh, not necessarily fitting in a certain category. Uh, every day of the week we look at a different genre. So by the end of the week, we've looked at about 60 or so books that were released this week. Uh, quick announcements. I do not have sprints tonight. I don't do them on Friday night. I will have them tomorrow afternoon at 1 p.m. Mountain Time, 3 p.m. Eastern. Those will go for five hours. I do them three times a week, Tuesday and Thursday evenings and Saturday afternoons. Let us jump in. Hope you had a good night. You're staying cool and hydrated. These uh, next four, I believe, are ones that we didn't have time to get to on Monday or Monday or Tuesday. These are mysteries. This one is definitely a cozy. <laughs> Death at Abbey Road, London Cozy Mystery Book Number 6 by Rachel McLean and Millie Ravensworth. Abbey Road, site of the, the iconic studio where the Beatles recorded, plus that zebra crossing. Without access to their beloved Routemaster buses, Diana and Zap are hopeful that they can attract business to Chartwell and Crouch tours by hosting tours of the studio and Diana has the connections to make it happen. But then on a tour of the studio, they hear disturbing noises from a recording booth and moments later, an old friend of Diana's is found dead. Did they overhear a murder? If so, who wanted to kill Diana's friend and why? And is there a connection to Chartwell and Crouch's former owner, Morris Walker? To uncover the killer, Diana and Zaff must delve into the past of Chartwell and Crouch, determine exactly how Morris ended up in prison, and face some uncomfortable truths, all while dealing with Gus the Cat's unusual antics and trying to keep Chartwell and Crouch afloat. Can they get to the truth before the killer strikes again? Excuse <coughs> me. Yes, I was feeling that one coming. Poisoned by the Book, a North Dakota Library Mystery by Ellen Jacobson, second in that series. Books can be deadly in the wrong hands. Thea Olson is looking forward to volunteering at the annual book fair and raising money for her local library. But when one of the most prominent citizens in her small North Dakota town is poisoned, Thea's plans take a sharp turn. With the assistance of her grandmother, the nerdy and handsome library director, and an obnoxious chameleon that only she can see, Thea searches for clues and follows leads. Despite the fact that the chief of police dismisses the idea of foul play, Thea's intuition tells her otherwise. As she interviews suspects, Thea stumbles across secrets and hidden motives that threaten to derail the investigation. Can Thea piece together the puzzle before another life is lost? Sorry, I've got my light attached here to the top of the tablet, and it covers just enough of the tab, so I have to see how to close it. The Concert Hall Killer by Jonathan Whitlaw. Third in the Bingo Hall Detectives. Lights, Camera, Murder. In the Lake District, someone's laying on a deadly welcome. The cast and crew of a popular TV crime drama are shooting in the Lake District, but behind the scenes, relationships are as tense as on screen. The director's reputation precedes him, and the two lead stars are feuding and rumors swirl. Meanwhile, the locals are enjoying the filming. Amita Khatri and her friends from Penrith Bingo Club are becoming social media stars with their behind-the-scenes pictures from filming, although her son-in-law, Jason, is taking it all with a pinch of salt. But when on-screen slaughter gets swapped for real-life murder at the concert hall where the TV drama is based and the genuine police are as baffled as the TV detectives, it falls to the locals to search for the truth. 
It seems like a taste of fame can be deadly, but what happens when a killer's plots are wilder than anything the writers can dream up? Yes, what happens? Tell us. Mint Tea and a Midsummer Murder by Victoria Tate, fifth in the Waterwheel Cafe Mysteries. A solstice sunrise reveals a mysterious death at Cotswold's Standing Stones. Can a rural police officer illuminate the truth before darkness falls? Passionate and hardworking community cop and cafe owner, Sergeant Kia Varma, serves up lattes and law in equal measure. Yet her dedication to her dual duties is tested when a festival midsummer gathering turns deadly at an ancient ring of stones. Aided by her fellow officers, this dedicated detective delves into the puzzling demise of a vibrant young woman. With no apparent cause of death and the community united in grief, Kia wonders if the whispers of murder are only echoes of her own intuition. Tragedy strikes closer to home when Kia is suddenly stricken and rushed to hospital. As she battles her mysterious condition, can the doctors discover what is ailing her before it's before she too becomes as cold as the uh, stone. <laughs> and this was that Lucy score that we had on Wednesday, but I it seemed to be more of a be more mystery. I thought she was romance. Although with that title, you'd think I would have realized something there. Uh, the body in the backyard. Riley Thorne, number four. Her spray tan, self-absorbed news anchor ex-husband careening back into her life was not on this psychic detective's bingo card. But not only does Griffin Gentry show up unexpectedly at Riley Thorne's door, the real shock is that he's begging for her help. However, Riley's hot de private detective boyfriend, Nick Santiago, refusing to take the job is, well, less of a surprise. Too bad for Nick that his octogenarian business partner overrules him and decides to take the lead on Griffin's case. And when a dead body makes it clear someone really is out to get I Riley's ex, the mile-long suspect list puts all hands on deck at Santiago Investigations, even the wrinkly retired ones. It's only a matter of time before Griffin brings danger directly to Riley's doorstep. And with she and Nick busy interviewing suspects, their elderly roommates are wreaking havoc in their surveillance department. Can Riley block out the chaos and focus on her psychic visions long enough to narrow down the, the list of suspects? Or will Griffin Gentry's karma be the downfall of them all? This next one was perhaps historical fantasy, mysticism historical mysticism, a rose by any other name by Mary Mc, McMine, McMin, McMin. My name has only been whispered heretofore. England, 1591. Rose Russia's passion for life runs deep. She loves mead and music, meddles with astrology, and laughs at her mother's warnings to guard her reputation. When Rose's father dies and a noble accuses her and her dear friend Cecily of witchcraft, they flee to the household of respected alchemists in London. But as their bond deepens, their sanctuary begins to feel more like a cage. To escape, they turn to the occult, secretly casting charms and selling astrological advice in the hopes of building a life together. This thriving underground business leads Rose to fair young noble Henry and playwright Will Shakespeare, and so begins a brief, tempestuous, and powerful romance, one filled with secret longings and deep betrayals. In this world of dazzling masks and decadent feasts where the stars decide futures, Rose will write her own fate instead. This one is a nonfiction. That sounded interesting. Alexander at the End of the World, Forgotten Final Years of Alexander the Great by Rachel Kouser. By 330 BC, Alexander the Great had reached the pinnacle of success, or so it seemed. He had defeated the Persian ruler Darius III and seized the capital city of Persepolis. His exhausted and traumatized soldiers were ready to return home to Macedonia. 
Yet Alexander had other plans. He was determined to continue heading east to Afghanistan in search of his ultimate goal to reach the end of the world. Of course, it was in Afghanistan then. Alexander's unrelenting desire to press on resulted in a perilous seven-year journey through the unknown eastern borderlands of the Persian Empire that would test the great conqueror's physical and mental limits. He faced challenges from the natural world, moving through deadly monsoons and extreme temperatures from a rotating cast of well-matched adversaries who conspired against him at every turn, and even from his own men who questioned his motives and distrusted his very beliefs uh, on which Alexander built his empire. This incredible sweep of time culminating with his death in 323 BC is the age at the age of 32 would come to determine Alexander's legacy and shape the empire he left behind. Oops. This next one is another nonfiction. Women in the Valley of the Kings by Kathleen Shepard. The history of Egyptology is often told as yet one more grand narrative of powerful men striving to seize the day and put the precious artifacts for their competing homelands, but that is only half the story. During the so-called Golden Age of Exploration, there were women working and exploring before Howard Carter discovered the tomb of King Tut. Before men even conceived of claiming the story for themselves, women were working in Egypt to lay the groundwork for all future exploration. In this book, the author brings the untold stories of these women back into this narrative. Shepard begins with some of the earliest European women who ventured to Egypt as travelers, Amelia Edwards, Jenny Lane, and Marianne Brocklehurst. Their travelogues, diaries, and maps chronicled a new world for the curious. In the vast desert, Maggie Benson, the first woman granted permission to excavate in Egypt, met Nettie Gourley, the woman who became her lifelong companion. They battled issues of oppression and exclusion and ultimately are credited with ex excavating the Temple of Mut. As each woman, woman scored a success in the desert, she set up the women who came later for their, for their own struggles and successes. Emma Andrews' success as a patron and archaeologist helped to pave the way for Margaret Murray to teach. Margaret's work in the university led to artist Amiche... Uh, Calverley's and Bertel Broom's ability to work on site at Abydos, creating brilliant reproductions of tomb art, and to Kate Bradbury's and Carolyn Ransom's leadership in critical Egyptological institutions. The book upends the grand male narrative of Egyptian exploration and shows how a group of courageous women charted unknown territory and changed the field of Egyptology forever. Uh, this next one is fiction. Every Rising Sun by Jamila Ahmed. It's a retelling of 1001 Nights and about Shahrazad. In 12th century Persia, clever and dreamy Shahrazad stumbles on the Malik's beloved wife in trying entwined with a lover in a sun-dappled courtyard. When Scheherazade recounts her first tale, the story of this infidelity to the Malik, she sets the Seljuk, Seljuk Empire on fire. Enraged at his wife's betrayal, the once gentle Malik beheads her. But when that killing does not quench his anger, the Malik begins to marry and behead a new bride each night. Furious at the murders, his province thieves seethes on rebellion's edge. To suppress her guilt, quell threats of a revolt, and perhaps marry the man she has loved since childhood, Scheherazade persuades her beloved father, the Malik's vizier, to offer her as the, his as the next wife. On their wedding night, Scheherazade begins a yarn, but as the sun ascends, she cuts the story short, ensuring that she will live to tell another tale, a practice she repeats night after night. But the Malik's rage runs too deep for Scheherazade to exercise alone, and so she and her father persuade them that the Malik to leave Persia to join Saladin's fight against the Crusaders in Palestine. It wasn't Palestine. With plots spun against the Seljuks from all corners, Scheherazade must maneuver through intrigue in the age's greatest courts to safeguard her people. All the while, she must keep the Malik enticed with her otherworldly tales because the slightest misstep could cost Scheherazade her head.
This is another fiction, although set with real peoples. The Windsor Conspiracy by Georgie Blaylock. American Amelia Montague defied her family five years ago to marry the man she loved, but that decision cost her everything. Disowned by her family and left a penniless widow, widow after her husband's death, Amelia becomes her cousin Wallace Simpson's private secretary in France. With no other prospects available, Amelia has no choice but to succeed and under their Aunt Bessie's direction, hopes to have a positive influence on Wallace and the Duke of Windsor. During the next two years, Amelia realizes that not everything with the Windsors is glittering happiness. Beneath the facade of the besotted couple simmers Wallace's rage at her stunted ambition, and the couple soon reveal themselves to be self-centered Nazi supporters who pursue their own interests at any cost. When the Germans invade France and the Windsors leave Amelia to escape the Gestapo on her own, Amelia finds herself in position to work for the most unlikely of employers, MI5 and the FBI. Convinced to work undercover, Amelia joins the Windsors in Nassau and soon realizes that Wallace's treachery extends far deeper than the U.S. and British government even knows. A lot of those things were known and true. Three Keys. This is a women's fiction. By Laura Pritchett. Becoming invisible is painful unless you know how to work it. Emily Brinks has just lost the three keys of her life's purpose, her husband, her job, and her role as a mom after her son went off to college. She's also mystified to find herself in middle age. How exactly had that happened? The terrifying idea of becoming irrelevant, invisible, and letting her life slip away into obscurity has her driving distracted through Nebraska with a broken plastic fork in her tangled hair. But what Emily has not found are three literal keys saved in a drawer for years from her and her husband's past. They are the keys to homes that she hopes will be empty and plans on spending time in. Embarking on an international and increasingly complicated journey, criminal behavior turns out to be challenging. She seeks to find a life truly her own. And that middle-aged business... As someone breaking the law, Emily finds there's a real benefit to being invisible when you're working on becoming the striking, bold, and very manifest itself you want to be. Oops. The Keeper of Stars by Buck Turner first in a series. Who says you can't rewrite the stars? It's 1962 when Tennessee native Jack Bennett meets out-of-towner Ellie Spencer. He quickly falls head over heels for the young woman whose greatest love has always been the stars, until Jack. As their summer romance blooms, so does their determination to be together despite the circumstances that threaten to keep them apart. But just when Jack thinks their future is certain, their romance is cut short by forces beyond their control. Twelve years later, Dr. Elizabeth Spencer, now a renowned professor of astronomy, receives a mysterious package. Inside is a novel about a young man and woman who meet at the water's edge and fall madly in love over one magical summer. As she immerses herself in the pages, Ellie realizes this is no ordinary story. It's their story. And hidden among the tales of stargazing and stolen kiss kisses is a detail that has her questioning everything. Seeking the truth, Ellie returns to the water's edge. But is it too late? Or can the love story Jack Penn bring the Bring them back together in time to rewrite the stars. That's a very pretty cover, too. Sorry, copy was required. Faded, third in the Ghosted series. She meets the man of her dreams in her dreams. Fiona Abri excels at keeping busy, running her family's Swiss watch company, and guarding her heart. She's so busy, she doesn't have time for a vacation, much less, less a love life. But then she's given a family heirloom rumored to let you dream your greatest desire. Suddenly, Fiona is spending her nights on a tiny tropical island in a completely different life. She's married. She has two kids. She lives in a colorful cottage on the beach. This dream life is so different from her hectic, busy life in the city that Fiona decides to live her dreams to the fullest. Swimming in the turquoise sea 
picnics under palms, stargazing on the beach. It's a slow, seductive dream life that conveniently stays in her dreams. But after kisses and confessions and long nights on the beach, Fiona starts to fall hard for her dream husband and her dream life. But what happens when opening yourself to love means falling for a life that isn't real and a man who doesn't exist? Because in the end, it's not fate. It's just a dream. And I would add, or is it? Last one. Where Are You, Echo Blue? by Haley Krischer. When Echo Blue, the most famous child star of the 90s, disappears ahead of a highly publicized television appearance on the eve of the millennium, the salacious theories instantly start swirling. Mostly people assume Echo has gotten herself in trouble after a reckless, reckless New Year's Eve. But Goldie Klein, an ambitious young journalist who also happens to be Echo's biggest fan, knows there must be more to the story. Why, on the eve of her big comeback, would Echo just go missing without a trace? After a year of covering dreary local stories for Manhattan Eye, Goldie is sure this will be her big break. Who better to find Echo Blue and tell her story the right way than her? And so Goldie heads to L.A. to begin a wild search that takes her deep into Echo's complicated life in which parental strife, friend breakups, rehab stints, and bad romances abound. But the further into Echo's world Goldie gets, the more she questions her own complicity in the young star's demise. Yet she cannot tear herself away from this story, which has now consumed her entirely. Meanwhile, we also hear Echo's side of things from the beginning, showing a young woman who was chewed up and spit out by Hollywood, as so many are, and who may have had to pay the ultimate price. And there you go. How about that? Are we good or what? Alrighty, that is it. That is the new releases this week. Hi, Mary. That's okay. Finished. Oh, did you? The Judge was good and I enjoyed it. Have started. Has anyone seen Charlotte Salter by Nikki French? Very good author. Very good author. Alrighty. Well, uh, once again, uh, I don't have sprints tonight. I don't do them on Friday nights. Uh, we will have them tomorrow afternoon at 1 p.m. Mountain Time, 3 p.m. Eastern. We do sprints three times a week. And uh, next week, we'll take a look at the new releases being set into the wild next week. Genre by genre. Hope you have a very good Friday. If I hope I see you tomorrow. If I don't, have a good weekend. Stay safe. Stay cool, stay hydrated as as always. Self-care. You are a precious person, and I hope you realize that. And also read good books. As the banner says, don't be a bookworm, be a bookie monster. Om nom nom. Have a good day, and God bless you. <laughs>